Sir? Are we on? I, I don't know. Are we on? Right. One, two, three, four. That on? Okay. All right, now, the way this thing works is uh, you just ask any question you want to ask, anything. Sky's the limit. Now, I'll try to give you a Bible answer. Uh, now, I can't give you all the scriptures that'll answer your question in 10 seconds. <laughs> but I can give you the first one, and then, then run the rest of them here. Now, this, this is about the fifth Bible I've worn out here, and this is... The trouble here is I've got three German shepherds, and they like to feed on the Word. <laughs> That's what I've got to <laughs> All right, everybody, go ahead and shoot. All right. How many times was anointment put on Jesus' feet or head while he was alive? Hey, boy. <laughs> Near as I can see, uh, one, two, three. And the first one, come to John and get to John chapter, oh, John chapter 12. And the next one, go back to Mark, and get Mark uh, chapter 14. And the next one, uh, get to Luke, and get Luke, and let me, I've got to get this here in 10 seconds. Luke, uh, I'd get these a lot better if I had my other Bible with me, but other Bibles, uh, I don't carry them around with me. I stick this old one here, it doesn't have any notes in it. It doesn't have any cross-reference in it, so I've got to remember everything. The other one has all notes, and I can get in half a second with the other one. But the trouble with the other one is I get to carry them around, I'm afraid to lose them. Uh, one of them is three volumes. And uh, if I ever lost that stuff, I'd lose 55 years of work. Uh, chapter 7. I'll look chapter 7. It's going to take me a little bit long here. All right, now, <clears throat> most, most, most commentaries put the anointing in Mark even with the anointing in John, but it's got problems to it. All right, uh, John chapter 12, and here's one for sure. Uh, here's a verse 3. Then Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anointed, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. All right, to uh, compare Mark. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he had set at meat. There came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, very precious. And she break the box and poured it on his head. Else, uh, in uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 3, it says, Being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Well, that might have been John 12, but it's unlikely. Because John 12 says, uh, verse 1, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, for well, that match, uh, where Lazarus was, was raised from the dead, and there they made him a supper. And Martha served, that's Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Well, how Simon the leper get in there? Maybe his father was a leper or something, or he got healed or didn't get healed, or what? I don't know. It looks, so someone make those two separate. All right, the third one here is Mark, uh, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 37. And a woman of the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the meat in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster box of ointment. Well, that thing matches the one over there in, in uh, John. Well, that thing there is not in Bethany at all, that thing there. That's a Pharisee's house. And... Uh, uh, she sat at meat and stood at his feet, began him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears. It wiped them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with oil. All right, chapter John 12, 3, uh, wiped his feet with hair and anointed the, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with hair, with the hair. Uh, Luke uh, uh, wiped with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Well, that looked like the same. But that's not the same at all. In Luke 7, that thing there, that a, a Pharisee got him invited out for dinner, a bunch of Pharisees sitting around the table, and that woman's a prostitute. That ain't Mary. And uh, in John chapter 12, that ain't no Pharisee's house. That's uh, Lazarus, Mary, and, and Martha. Oh, and I'd guess, I'd say, three times. So, now, I may have missed a reference. Have you got anything that would give any more time? That's all I can remember, three of them. 
There you go. There you go. That's right. All right. Yeah, they're not the same. They're not the same. All right, something else. Yes, sir. Uh, if you could give me two or three things you would do when you become the president of the United States, and uh, then give me scripture to back that. To back. <laughs> Now, I did get the first part of the question. The first part was what? What you will do as President of the United States what to help I, this country? What I would do? Yes, sir. Okay. And give me scripture to back it. All right. Uh, yeah, I can say it some things I do. Oh, I turn to back it. I'll show you the first thing I'll do. A back it. A back it. And I could get a back a chapter. Oh, get a back a uh, chapter two. I was trying to raise money uh, with uh, bingo and lotteries, and I quit trying to raise money by having my place be a resort for sodomites, and I quit raising money by selling liquor. A back a chapter two, verse fifteen. Woe to him that gives his neighbor a drink. And puts the bottle to him and makes him drunken, I may look upon his nakedness. Look at the context. Woe to him that builds a town with blood and establishes a city by iniquity. It's wrong to do wrong to raise money for a town. So I'd do what first thing I'd do, do is I'd still be able to do with the state lotteries. That's gambling. I do with all of them. You see why? Well when I came up I was a felony. You know what they call that? Called the numbers racket. And the numbers racket was done in the streets of New York and Detroit and Pittsburgh and those places. You go down to the little punch board. You charge a guy 25 cents to punch out a number. And if he got the lucky number, he'd get back a half a dollar or a dollar. I said, well, that's gambling. Yep. Now, that, that's legalized in the state. I'd make that illegal. And as far as the liquor goes, I would have the government, I'd, have, I'd close every government liquor store in the country. Yep. You say, well, would you forbid bootlegging? No, I'd leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> And you'd say, why? Because that stuff's done in private property by private crops by a private man, and that's his business. It's your business to have better sense to buy it if it ain't the right kind. <laughs> yeah, man, like that. <laughs> I mean, if you get drunk or get killed from drinking the stuff, well, you pay your own price. But that's, uh, government has no business making money off that stuff. Oh, I'd, uh, I'd do that, too. The next thing I'd do, I mean, you can see right away, I'd get shot real quick. I wouldn't last in, I wouldn't last in office of more than a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, Act, I'd get Act 17. Next thing I'd do, Act 17 in Deuteronomy chapter 32. I mean, if you want to run a government by the Bible, the Bible's real clear. But they're not going to take this book. Deuteronomy 32 and Act 17. I'd say if the folks want to go back where they came from, they can go back where they came from if they're not willing to become Americans. Now, if you're going to become Americans and live in America, you ought to learn American language. And the idea of coming over and making us learn your language, that's, that's something. And the next thing about it is this is better than your country, then you want to come over here, then you're coming over into a Protestant Bible-believing country. And not very many of them left, but that was founded by that. Now, this country was founded by, and I hate to get racist right along here, but you're going to have to, you know, have to tell the truth somewhere. Amen. Uh, this country was founded, now I know some of you don't like this, but I can't help you, you'll have to grow up one day. Uh, this country was founded by white, Protestant, male, straight uh, people. Male, Protestant, white, straight. There wasn't one woman. Now, take it or leave it. There wasn't one woman in connection with the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or the Declaration of Independence. You believe in God bless America, wave the banner, I pledge allegiance to the flag? Well, let me tell you something, honey. There wasn't one woman connected with it. Now, you're not rubber up and getting the woman. I'm going to get all of you before I get through here. I ain't going to show any favoritism. You know me better than that. 
All right, they're all white. There wasn't an Oriental, there wasn't an African connected with that thing, they were all white. You say, you're superior. No, don't give me that stuff, don't give me that stuff. I bet I've hugged more black people than anybody in this building. Hugging, boy. You say, well, I'm preaching the prisons. I got brothers and sisters in Christ all over them prisons. When I get up there, hey, Dr. Ruckman, hey, Dr. Ruckman. <laughs> Raise the Bible. <laughs> Come down, hug them. Big old boys. I mean, big back bucks, boy. I mean, six feet five, six feet six sweat. Some of you be afraid to touch them. Amen. It's going to be a long morning, boys and girls. Don't you give me this racist stuff. I was there preaching, I tell those lifers, I say, you guys doing hard time, I don't think you're going to do any hard time if you're saved. And I said, I, I, I can't set any date for you, but if things go like that going uh, in two years, you're going to see the biggest jailbreak you ever saw in your life. And I said, you ain't going over the fence, you're, you're going up to the ceiling. And old big old boy in the back said, that sounds like a winner to me. <laughs> But you gotta face something. Those people set up this country, they were they were white and they were male and they were straight. There wasn't one queer connected. With them. Now think. I mean, just don't sit there and get the jitters. I mean, think what I'm saying. I'm giving you history. I'm gonna give you anybody the idea. There wasn't a female on there, there wasn't a queer on there, there wasn't another race on there. And they were Protestants. There are no Catholics set up the Bill of Rights. He had nothing to do with it. I think one Catholic signed the Constitution, and I don't think there's any on the Declaration of Independence. You can check it and see. But this country, if this country began with the King James Bible, and your Puritan fathers came over with the Geneva Bible, and the Geneva Bible, the same Greek text as the King James Bible. You call that a reception. There's five editions: one by Erasmus, one by Colonius, one by. Beza, one by Stephanus, and one by Alizir. They don't match. You want to get that, too. You hear fellows say, well, we go by the Texas Receptus. You don't even know what it is. Right. Right. And these fellows say, well, it's just the preserved Greek word of God, the preserved uh-uh, uh-uh. You can take five editions of the Receptus, they won't match. The problem you got is when you read uh, one Receptus says one thing, another Receptus says the other, what's your final authority for your choice? And they do say different in about, oh, maybe a variation of 1,000, 30 or 1,000 verses. Now, I've got that problem settled real easy. I said it to this. I say if one reading agrees with this, it's the right reading, and if they don't agree with this, it's the wrong reading. I have one authority. Right there. They shift it back and forth so they can be the final authority. Or oh, not how this country was set up. Now, that country, that isn't this country you're living in now. This country you're living in now is not set up that way. Uh, the, your, the one you're sitting, you're sitting in right now, I, I, can, I can check you on it real quick, see how honest the people folks are. Uh, now, don't raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you a question. Is America a great country? One more question. Is it the greatest country now on the face of the earth? I'm going to ask you another question. Did this thing go out? Still going? Okay, sound like it went out about there. That's about where it ought to go out. <laughs> and now let me ask you this. Was America ever a great country? Is America still a great country? Now, one more. If it is a great country, or it ever has been a great country, question, what made it a great country? All right. Last question. Name me one thing that television promotes day and night in the last 50 years. I'll give you 50 years. Tell me one thing they promoted day and night on all channels, 24 hours a day for 50 years, that ever made America a great country. Name me one. You can't do it. You say, well, patriotism. That just came out since Iraq. They haven't been promoting patriotism in America through Vietnam and Korea. Don't kid me. Burning the American flag, urinating the American flag. Don't, don't, don't pull my leg, man. 
My daddy was a colonel in World War II and a captain in World War I, and my grandfather was a general in the Philippine insurrection. You can't name one thing that television pushes night and day on all channels that made this country a great country. You can't name one cotton-picking thing in 50 cotton-picking years. All right, now what's the problem? Acts chapter 17, I'll show you the problem. New Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 32, Old Testament. Here's the problem. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, verse uh, 8. When the Most High divided. Uh-oh. Well, let's don't have any of that. But that's God you're looking at there. The Most High divided. Now, he wouldn't do that, would he? He don't believe in division, does he? When the Most High divided the nations to their inheritance, when he separated... Oh, come on. That's a cuss word, isn't it? <laughs> Isolation, separation. You see, the country you're raised in is not America. America was a Bible-believing country. Separated the sons of Adam. He set the bounds, boundaries. Fences make good neighbors. You don't build bridges, you put up fences. <laughs> Gets quiet in here all the time. Now listen, don't you go out of here, you rascal, and say, Ruckman, 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 Ruckman. Ruckman ain't the problem. I didn't write this cotton-picking book. <laughs> I didn't write a word of it. The problem is this book. Oh, I do it around me 32, and you're not going to talk me out of it. If you, hear me, if you ever hear Ruckman correct a word in here and change a word in here, you'll know he's either lost his mind or he's under torture. <laughs> but in my right mind, I ain't going to mess with this book. Amen. He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Well, I know how many of them were there. Well, there were 12 of them. Nations, that's the U.N. Plural, nations. You know what God said about the U.N.? In Isaiah 40, the nations are less than a drop in a bucket. All nations before him are like a drop in a bucket, listen to me, and less than nothing. The United States in God's sight is a minus Amen. zero. Isaiah 40. The nations are less than nothing. Zero. Minus. It's a cipher of the wind knocked off. Now, I know you get used to that. You get used to patriotic stuff. You couldn't possibly be more red, white, and blue than I am. No way in the world, man. I mean, I came in a military family. My dad, my, my dad's idea of a fun even was put out battle maps on the table when I was 10, 11, 12 years old and explained logistics to me and routes of supply and field targets and azimuths for laying down a base of fire. That was his idea of a big fun evening, you know. <laughs> Well, I came up there in uh, two years of citizen military training camp, four years of reserve officer training, nine weeks of basic, 17 weeks of officer Canada school, a year of Army athletic staff and command school, and 46 months in the infantry. You're not going to get any more red, white, and blue than I am. But that Bible says all the nation before him are less than zero. Nothing. Uh, God's a very desperate, prejudiced, uh, narrow-minded bigot. He says, Israel will not be numbered among the nations. That's Numbers 23. That's a separate nation. Did you ever wonder about them Ten Commandments? There's chapter 10 in your Bible is a list of the Gentiles, and they come from Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Noah is a tenth from Adam. And in Genesis 10, verse 10, is the first Gentile kingdom. It's in Babel, Nimrod. Assyrian. Ten. 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 Call of the Gentiles, Romans 10, verse 10. First opening of the door to the Gentiles, Acts chapter 10. That 10 is a Gentile number. You count by 10. You count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. And then 11. And then 12. See the 1, 2, and 13, 3, 14, 4, and when you get to 0, 20, you start over again. You count for tens. God counts for sevens. And he got something to seven, it's finished. Six days, rest the seventh day. You run seven weeks, seven times seven, Pentecost. 
You run the seven months, the uh, Feast of Tabernacle, Day of Atonement. You run the seven years, you've set the land free. You run the seven, seven years, Jubilee, 50. See? God counts by seven. The Gentiles count by ten. A ten is a Gentile number. Okay, here come these ten commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And then right in the middle of that thing, there's one commandment sitting there. And it's an exception to the ten. That's where seven dead Adventists breaks his fool neck. He gets there and tries to make the Sabbath something for you to observe, a Jewish Sabbath, Friday to Saturday. That's for a Jew. Ten, those ten commandments, those are for the nations. The Ten Commandments are not a little something for a Jew. That's for everybody breathes. But one of them is picked out there that don't match the rest of them. It's the Sabbath. That's a ceremonial law, brethren. The rest of them are moral laws. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. Observe the Sabbath. Well, that ain't no moral regulation. That's a ceremonial regulation. That's for Israel. Why? Because in the millennium, Israel will run the world. Amen. Amen. Do you know your Bible well enough to know that? Who's on the throne of the millennium? Why, he's a Judean Jew from the tribe of Judah. Boy, tell that to Muhammad, watch him have a fit. <laughs> so there's one in there that don't match. So God got all these nations. My determination is to gather the nation, assemble the king, and I may pour out upon him my fierce wrath. And though I'll make an end of all the nations, whether I've driven you, I won't make an end of you. And the one that is not numbered among the nations is Israel. That, that's selective, discriminatory bigotry. God has one race, the chosen race. And it's not the white race. I ain't no white supremacist. I'm not no Aryan nation, see. What God does, he picks out one, and the one he picked out was the Jew. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Now, that's an oriental. Do you have something about this? All religions in the world come from one man. And it's not a white man, and it's not a black man. It's a brown man. <laughs> you say, why shouldn't it be? The word Adam means red-brown. Do you think? <laughs> I mean, do you know how many brown people there are along with white people and black people? Why don't you think? If you took all the Asiatics, you ever seen that, 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 that those land masses? Boy, I've seen them. I've been over there in Korea, and I've been over there in India and Bombay and Hyderabad and seen those people. You take those people in China and Mongolia and Japan and Malay and Indonesia and India and across in there, they'd outnumber you white and you black folks three to one. You say, why? Because the original color is red-brown. I'll give you some stuff. Song of Solomon, the bride speaking of her Savior. My beloved is white and ruddy. Are you D.D.? Now, hey man, you can't give this in the New Bible. These New Bibles took all these words out. Do you know what ruddy is? R-U-D-D-Y? That's swarthy. That's red-brown. That's like red-brown clay. Ruddy. It's like an American Indian. That's why they call you pale-face. <laughs> You pay a face. Folks about white folks and black folks. Most black folks aren't black. I mean, uh, black is... Let me see the black. Brother, would you stand up? My brother was behind you. Would you stand up? Yeah. Would you look at his coat? That's black. Most black folks are shades of brown. You get in Central Africa, you get some real, just black, real black. But you take you white folks, you ain't white. There ain't a white man in this building. You want to see what white looks like? <laughs> you think I'm white? <laughs> I ain't white. What you talking about, man? I ain't white. When you're white, you're dead. <laughs> see, now, you can't get this in any college in the world. You understand that? <laughs> they don't teach this stuff. But you folks, you folks are white folks. You're pink. Or oh, you're kind of a real light brown. You're, you're, uh, you're pale face. You Indian take one look at you and think, oh, there's no blood, you know. <laughs> All right, now, this thing is set up so the nations are nothing, and one nation is separate, and God separated, separated, separated Israel. When you get saved, you're separated. Now, you're not separated from other race, but you're separated from unsaved people. And that's what that thing is about. Now, there are 12 nations. 
There's got to be, because when he put the bounds, he set them according to the number of the children of Israel, and there are 12 of them. So, let's see, you've got Shem, you've got Ham, you've got Japheth. All right, then Ham's got to have uh, four main races. And Japheth has to have four main races, and Shem's got to have four main races to make 12. And they'll be there. They'll be there. All right, Acts chapter 17, New Testament. You don't like Old Testament? Let's try New Testament. New Testament, Acts chapter 17. Now, you understand he's asking what I'd do if I was president. <laughs> Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And it's made of one blood all nations of men that dwell upon the face of the earth. There's one place that all the races are the same. You say, where's that? Their blood. But you don't get your racial characteristics from your blood. You get them from your genes and chromosomes. So the word blood has been taken out of all the new Bibles. Like that. To make you think they're all just the same all the way. No, they're not. They're the same as far as blood goes. Now, if a white man gets a transfusion by a black man, it's not going to turn his skin black. And if the black folks, they get a transfusion by Shemite, it's not going to make your eyes slant. It's don't worry about it. <laughs> your blood is the same. Now, you get blood type to match, but you all have the same blood. Oh, now look here, I've made of one blood, all nations of men dwell upon the face of the earth. Now, well, look out. And it determined the times before appointed, underline it, and the bounds, the bounds of their habitation. Deuteronomy 32, he set the bounds. Fences make good neighbors. You say, why is that? Because you understand then what's yours and what's his. The reason friends to make good neighbors, when it comes down there, you understand that the stuff on this side is yours, and the stuff on that side is his. And you don't go on his side, you don't come over on your side. But you folks, uh, you live in the great last age of the Laodicean church, where the whole thing is get together, get together, get together, get together, cut down, cut, cut out all the fences, and build bridges. Reach out and touch. And mix things that are not the same. Amen. Now, I didn't say equality. I don't say anybody is superior to anybody else. Uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a racial bigot, I'd say the Jews got the advantage. <laughs> you say, why? Well, can't you figure that out, stupid? <laughs> <laughs> there is no European writer in that book. There are 66 books, and one race wrote every one of them. Yeah, and it wasn't yours. Christ said, John 4, salvation is of the what? Jews. Say it again. Jews. Say it again. Jews. Loud. Jews. There you go. That's better. You can't be anti-Semitic and even believe the Bible. Amen. Your Savior was a Jew. Amen. A good old hook-nosed kike. Amen. Amen, brother. All this stuff. Well, you take that anti-Semitic stuff, that stuff is supernatural. Why should anybody hate a bunch of people like that? What's, what's the reason for such hatred of just one race? That's supernatural. That is natural. You take, uh, you take Adolf Hitler now. Adolf Hitler goes out to kill those Jews, kills six million of them, uh, give or take a few hundred thousand either way, and, and killing those Jews. I've seen those pictures. I've got probably the largest collection of Holocaust stuff you ever saw. And I've been in Dachau. I walked across Buchan. I've been, been across the place where they call the road, men of the dog cells, and see what they burned them, and all that kind of thing. And those six million Jews he killed, they weren't House of Rothschild international bankers, downtown Illuminati, they're not that bunch he killed. That bunch he killed was just ordinary, plain, lower, middle class people. And about half of them were children. They weren't running the international bankers. So they're not a Ku Klux Klan, they're not worried about the the, the, the Jewish uh, conspiracy to take over the world by the protocols of the elder learned the learned elders of Zion. I read all that crap before I was 30 years old. They were just ordinary Jewish people. Now, brethren, that's irrational. Why would you like kill a, kill a, a, a million boys and girls under 10 years old, you know, because of the conspiracy and the bankers, all that kind of stuff, the international bankers, that stuff is supernatural. 
You know why it's supernatural? Because in Revelation chapter 12, when the devil comes back, the Bible said he went after that woman and her seed. Why? Because she brought forth a Messiah. Old uh, Napoleon got a map of Europe one time and pointed at England, which is really pink on a map, and he said, but for that one red spot, I would have conquered the world. Well, the devil looks at this world, and if it wasn't for one red spot, he'd have got the whole thing. And you know where the spot is, don't you? All right, so he has a special, he has a special uh, empathy against that Jew. And that's what's behind that stuff. Well, I'll take a thing like that. I wouldn't. I would. I wouldn't set up a. I wouldn't put up a setup where one race was superior to another. I would say all equal except the Jew. He's not. He's obviously superior. But I would set up some kind of system where a fellow can have fellowship with his own people, and we want to have fellowship with his own people, and wouldn't be forced to have fellowship with people he didn't want to have fellowship with. I put that up. And that'd give me a lot of that win me a lot of friends and influence people now, wouldn't it? <laughs> you want a classless, sexless, raceless society? I can tell you where you find it. I know where it is. If you want to get a place for the no distinction between races and classes and sexes, I'll show you where it is. It's a federal pen. <laughs> Brother Miller, <laughs> you know about those things, don't you? We got about five guys from our school that spend the whole time dealing with that kind of stuff. It's a maximum security prison. They treat them all just the same. You want to get in that? <laughs> all right. Now the next thing I do, and uh, this would really win me friends and influence people. <laughs> I would uh, turn to First Timothy and get chapter six. I would get rid of the Federal Reserve Bank. I'd get uh, and kick the UN out. I'd, I'd separate from the UN. I'd say, now you guys from Africa go back to Africa, and you guys from Europe go back to Europe, and you guys from Asia get back to Asia, and you guys from South America get down there and leave this place for people who want to live here. And if any of you folks want to live here, stay here and welcome, but learn the language, okay, so we can catch a plane without missing it, you know, or get the groceries when we get them. <laughs> Most driving thing you saw getting these airports. Oh, shut up, man. All right, First Timothy chapter six. This verse has been changed. Now, don't you know they changed all these in these new Bibles? First Timothy chapter six, verse ten. For the love of money is the root of all evil. You can't find that verse in the new Bible. You can't find it in the New King James. Bible. That verse is gone. You know why? The money-mad fellow trying to sell that new version uh, doesn't believe it is the rule of all evil, but it is. Now, it doesn't say the origin. Sin originated with the devil. You've got to be careful when you read, see. It's present tense. The love of money is now, in this present system, it is the root of all evil. So I can't believe that. Well, you're not thinking. Who thinks these days? They ain't time to think. <laughs> Some of you guys raised in the country, you have an advantage. You had time to think. <laughs> but you can't think in traffic, man. You stop to think, you get killed. <laughs> I was going along the road one day in Bay Minette, Alabama, a little old road stop down in Alabama, and I was coming back from somewhere, and I saw a guy walking along there in his bare feet, and overall, he must have been about 15, 16 years old. He walking along there, and you always tell the country boy the way he walks, you know. You, well, I, I, you could tell, uh, I, I'm not as good as I used to be, but you see a guy walking like this. He'd been in the Navy. Oh, he's a commercial fisherman. <laughs> That's the way they walk. You say, what is that? That's that boat. <laughs> <laughs> he's rocking with a boat. I've been over Germany and seen guys over there. When I, I've been over there about five times. And over in Germany, you see guys walk there. 70 or 75 years old, and they're just straight as a ramrod like this. Blue eyes, about six feet tall, and they walk down the street like this. <laughs> That's Gestapo and SS, boy. That's, don't kid me. Now, a country boy walks like this. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> and you, you know what he's doing? <laughs> he's stepping over the road, see? <laughs> oh, oh. 
<laughs> and I see this guy, I see this guy going around about 15 years old, and he's got a scowl on his face. And I just passed by him slow, maybe about 50 miles an hour, and just looked at him, and he didn't look up, just scowling. And I thought to myself, oh, what's that guy, what's that guy got in mind, what's he thinking about? And the Lord said, don't you know what he's doing? I said, no, the Lord said, he's thinking. <laughs> it's an effort for him, see? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I said to my cousin made one time, I said, Evelyn, she worked for me for 23 years. Fine Christian woman. I don't know white woman in the world can outwork her. Honest, just honest she could be. And she said, I said at one time, I said, Evelyn, you ever worry? She said, no, sir, I never worry. And I said, well, you know, white folks worry a lot. She said, well, she says, uh, uh, the government is feeding me, uh, the, the government is leading, uh, the government is feeding me and the Lord is leading me. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, don't you ever worry? She said, I've tried to worry, but she said, I get tired and go to sleep. <laughs> I wish I could do that. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, me too. But you take now down to my school, and my school is about three quarters southern, about a quarter Yankee. And we get some Yankees. I mean, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. Hey, man, shut your mouth, man. I shut up, man. That kind of stuff, you know. And, and the southern boys, they don't hardly ever make good grades the northerners do. And the reason why is a southern, now, I'm telling you the truth now, see. I'm no spring chicken. I've seen all kinds of things. And you take a southern, southern boys, outdoor boys. The weather's got a lot to do with it. And that Yankee up there is locked in, I mean, from November to, to April. He's just <laughs> blizzards and gray and ice melting and bullets. Man, it's terrible. Man. But they got more time indoors, more bookish. And southerners aren't bookish. You got a young fellow there, and he gets to come to our church, uh, school. He's been out of uh, school for oh, maybe 10, 15 years or something. We got guys there 40 and 50 years old. They have a terrible time first year making themselves, uh, you know, understand a book. Because a book don't look like anything. A scissor southerner. Go pick up a book and say, oh, uh, and then that have. Believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren. Be waiting for, you know, for <laughs> the illustration for this, to make it what, it what he read real and it don't come, see? Then he says, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved. <laughs> And nothing happened, you see. <clears throat> you see the trouble, the trouble with the southern is he look, he, that's one dimensional. See, it's a flat page with little black dots on it, you see. And a southerner used something like a saw or a hammer or a hoe or a wrench, see, or a lathe or a shovel of something, you know, that you handle it's, it's real. And that thing is just ink on pages. <laughs> that's why I have a time with that. Oh, now think now, the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, how could that be? What about these sex perverts? These guys walking around in diapers, you know, and crawling windows at night and raping five-year-old kids and taking little girls and cutting off their fingers, you know, and serial killers. How could that be connected with money? Well, that's easy. How does your eye get twisted like that? Well, he's got to be reading something rotten or seeing something rotten. Well, who produces that? Who puts out them pornographic magazines? Don't you know what costs money? Don't you know you buy them things? You take up in Vermont, they broke up a child pornography ring up there about 10 years ago, and the leader in it was 14 years old. In New England, man, in the country in New England, he didn't get that stuff out of those mountains in Vermont, New Hampshire. He got that from downtown L.A. or Chicago or New York. You say, what, through the boob tube? The solar disk. Yes, sir. We got that stuff from. And now you got an internet web where anybody can pick it up in the living room, on the computer. You get a double increase. Right. Who sells them computers? Yeah. Who buys them? Who makes the film? Who does the acting for the for the thing? See, money. The love of money is rule of all evil. I've said for years and years, if it don't make sense, there's a buck in it. Yeah. 
Amen. And I've never known that thing to fail. Amen. You say, like what? Like our foreign policy, for one thing. <laughs> if it don't make any sense, it's a dollar bill every time. Oh, now the trouble is the money. That's the problem. I don't, I don't really believe, I don't really believe anything wrong with the Middle East as far as the U.S. goes except uh, drug traffic and oil. I think that's probably why they're over there, to make sure they keep on growing poppies in Afghanistan and get pumping oil out of Iraq, as far as I know. People, I'm a military family. Uh, any infantryman, any dog face, they call them doughboys in World War I, they call them dog face in World War II, they call them grunts in Vietnam. Any infantryman knows that you never have, you never fight over things. All battles are over real estate, ground, infantry, ground troops. If you can't conquer the ground and hold the ground, you ain't won the war. You've got to win the ground, and you've got to stay in the ground where he can't get back in, or you ain't won it. Anybody know? You can't have a war against terrorism. You war against people. Germany against England, England against Russia, China against Japan, Japan against the Philippines. Nations fight each other. There's no such thing as a war on crime. <laughs> That's politician stuff, buddy. That's for suckers. The war on drugs. How'd it come out? Well, they all got drugged. <laughs> how'd, how'd the war on crime come out? It increased 300% every year. The war on terrorism. There's no war on terrorism. Terrorism is in Indonesia right now. They're killing, raping, burning churches, and raping women over there right now daily. He goes right on to Israel. It's picked up. It's doubled in Israel. You don't war against things. You war against nations, against people. The last world war in this country is in, in history is the Battle of Armageddon, and that's the war of the nations against God. That's God fighting his own creation and his own creation fighting him. That's the only one where it isn't just nation against nation. That's where all the nations get together and fight against him. You on the right side? Yes, sir. I hope you are. All right, so the first thing I'd do coming in is I'd say, all right, now, uh, I passed a law in Congress that we print uh, $3 trillion worth of $1,000 bills and give them to the Federal Reserve Bank, the, the, all the big shots, and pay them off and tell them to get out and don't come back. Amen. And from now, we'll print our own money by an act of Congress. Well, they'd say we wouldn't take the money. And I'd say, honey, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Amen. <laughs> I mean, that's the stuff you've been giving us. Yeah, right, right. You know, since 1918, yeah. you've been giving us that paper money, and bless God, you can take it yourself. So here's your three trillion bucks. I'd erase the national debt in less than 12 hours. Amen. <laughs> a vote for Ruckman is a vote for catastrophe. <laughs> I'm dramatic. I say the answer is not integration, and the answer is not uh, segregation. The answer is disintegration. <laughs> no, I have something else. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. There's a lot of folks around the country uh, propagating this tried by fire, trying to uh, say Tyndall's version. If you want to have the right Bible, you're going to have to have Tyndall's version. Could you please uh, explain for the tape here why God does no longer bear witness to the early English translations and bears witness to the King James Bible? All right. Uh, take your Bible and turn to uh, Psalm 12. I wish I had on my notes here with me, but I haven't got them. But Psalm 12 will, will start you off right. Because it points out there's one translation that's going to be purer than the rest of them. Psalm 12. This has been changed. See, these questions you're asking, the fellows who did these new Bibles, they're all led by a spirit. And the devil knows that Bible from cover to cover. He knows just which verses to mess with. And he messed with all these. Psalm 12. And Psalm 12, oh, now I'm reading verse uh, yeah, 6. The words of the Lord. Now notice that's not the principles. It's not the fundamentals. And it's not the preserved Word of God. That's the latest 
hook and crook. The guys who still entertain their own authority and pretend they're King James believers say, I believe the King James Bible is the preserved Word of God. No, honey, we don't want that. We want words. That Word of God, that's Bath and Bruno, that's New Orthodoxy. Don't kid me, kid somebody else. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure W-O-R-D-S. The question, brethren, is do you have the words God wants you to have? Well, you've got them or you don't. Christ said, He that is of God heareth God's W-O-R-D-S. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not a God. The question is, do you have the words of God? Well, I've got them in my own language. I've got them in English. What about those folks in Spanish? What about both folks, those Germans? I have no doubt at all that God knows more than one language. Amen. I mean, when I go to Germany, I preach out of Martin Luther. I go to Mexico, I preach out of Valera. When I go over there to, to uh, Korea, my translator is Song Lee. When I go to India, my translator is Kumar. When I go to Russia, my translator is Major Taras, who got saved translating under me. <laughs> and when I go down there to Mexico, I used to have Weldon Jones translate for me. Now, he got killed in a car wreck about a year ago, and his boys translate for me. Uh, I'm sure that God knows how to tra- put the Bible to give you in your language the words you ought to have. And it may not be English. It may not match the King James. Well, then what do you do about that? Well, you, you think. And when you think, you know that languages have different idioms, and if God translated word for word the King James into Spanish, it'd be a Spanish Bible wouldn't worth, be worth reading. Because the idioms aren't the same. God spoke in more than seven different languages at Pentecost. You think you're going to have trouble with your language? <laughs> And I'll show you what I mean. A fellow named McVeigh one time down near Virginia, Ohio, by East Steps Church, put out a, a, a King James in, in Spanish, and he wanted me to promote it. And I wouldn't promote it. And then he accused me of not believing on being honest in the King James if I wasn't willing to accept a Spanish translation into English, or English tra- tra- uh, King James into a Spanish translation from the King James Bible. And I told him, and I'll tell you, I am not a language expert. I don't profess to be. I don't even profess to be a scholar. I profess to be a student. Uh, I, te- I, teach, I can teach Hebrew and Greek without much trouble. But I'm not a Hebrew scholar or a Greek scholar. I wouldn't attempt the translation just because I can teach it. If you're going to make a translation to Spanish, you need Spanish-speaking people that understand Spanish. If you're going to get a German one, you need German pe- save German people that believe German and know how to speak German. Because you're not going to... Well, I'll take the example. McVeigh put out his King James in Spanish, and it said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. And he used the Hispanic word for suffer, which I don't know what it is, but I mean the word suffer in Spain means suffer. It means hurt. In Old English, it doesn't mean that. It means put up with it. If you read it word for word in the King James Spanish, you'd have a rotten Spanish Bible. So you got to think, man. <laughs> And the idioms aren't the same. Now, I, I don't know Sp- Spanish well enough. God knows I should. I had three years in middle school and two years in high school and a year in college. But if you don't speak it or use it, you know, for 20, 30 years, you forget it. And I, for- I remember enough to know that A is, you know, feminine and O is masculine. I remember that. <laughs> I know there's no such thing as Santa Claus. Because <laughs> he was a man, he got the wrong name. Santa. Santa is a woman's name. Santa Maria, Santa Lucia. See? Why, master the son. San Luis Obispo, San Jose. That's a man. Santa Claus, a man with a woman's name. <laughs> That's a dyke or a bush. <laughs> That's why Chelsea Clinton is so ugly, Janet Reno is her father. <laughs> Not my <night>. you take. <laughs> well, it's great to be saved, brother. I mean, I mean, you can enjoy life, man. Because if it ends right now, it's going to end right. Okay. Uh, you take, uh, you take in German. I know the German is a little bit better. The German put the verb in the end of the sentence. And you get a German thing, you don't want the guy said until he says the last word. Because <laughs> the verb's sitting over on the end. And I'll give you a good example. Uh, 
Wie geht es Ihnen? Es geht mir gut, danke. Können Sie mir sagen, wo der Bahnhof ist? Now you come here, steady guy, you say, you're saying, uh, good morning, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, how are you? Can you tell me where the railroad station is? But look at this thing. You come that crowd, you say, wie geht es Ihnen? Now what does that say? That says, how goes it to you? Wie geht es Ihnen to you? You're not saying, uh, how's it going? Now if you translate it, you say, how's it going? How does it go to you is not good English. <laughs> If you're coming from German English, you've got to say, how's it going? How's it going? Okay, how's it going with you? German, wie geht es Ihnen? Es geht mir gut, danke, und Ihnen? And you're saying, how does it go to you? It goes to me good, and to you? That's not good English. That's a rotten English Bible, if it's translated that way. And yeah, those are idioms. In plain words, the Germans have a way of saying a thing. I'm sure the Spanish do the same, I'm certain of it and the Italian, and all those languages. I'm certain of it. Uh, German, he'll, you, you can't use du, 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 uh, du bist mein Herr, you know, that kind of uh, thing. You are, you know. Uh, du bist. Ich, uh, er ist. Those things that do is a personal thing. When you talk to a German and say, can you tell me where the railroad is, you say, können Sie mir sagen, wo der Bahnhof ist? You're saying, can they tell me? That's third person plural. You can't say, kannst du. Now, if you know the guy, you say, kannst du. Kannst du. Uh, that means, can you tell me? Kannst du sagen, wo der Bahnhof ist? But if you use du, you, you, you'll turn them off. Because you don't use du unless you know the person for weeks and months and are close to them. Now, those Germans aren't dumb, brother. I'll tell you, I've been in many a place there where I come in there and I'll say, Can you mind here speak English? Can anybody, can anybody here speak English? And they'll all shake their heads. No, I'll speak English. I'll say, Well, I said, Hello, uh, and surely you can see me here. If you mind, Schlecht Deutsch. Please forgive me for my bad German. Oh, uh, it's been, I'm, you know, I'm a kind of stupid. My Deutsch is nicht sehr gut. My German is not so good. And they begin to smile and they say, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what those birds will do? They'll check you to see if you've taken time out to learn their language. Yep. And if you haven't, you you got the door shut. Yep. Now, I tell my young men, call the mission field. I've got 64 of them overseas. Out of our one church, we put out 64 missionary families. They're overseas right now. Hey, Ruckman don't qualify as a pastor. Okay, I'm not a pastor. I train missionaries. <laughs> <laughs> and they're over there. They're speaking in 12 different languages. They've learned 12, learned them. They're preaching in the, in the 12 different languages over there. And now, those idioms, they're going to have to learn those idioms. Now, I tell you guys, when you go to a foreign country, number one, you can't take America with you. Don't try it. Try to get her to make Democrat. That crazy Bush, I mean, I guess he's saved, but when I vote for him, I'm going to be crying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when that crazy Bush going there to make de democracy out of, you, out of your mind, kid. Amen. You don't know what you're talking about, man. And those people have the own way of doing things. You can't turn them all into Americans. You can't do that. In the Philippines, you don't uh, point at anybody. You say, well, it's like putting a hex on them. <laughs> They're places, they, they're foreign countries where you don't pass somebody when you're walking. It's rude. See? In the Japanese, you go in the guy's house, you take off your shoes before you go in the house. And the, the Hispanics down south, they have a siesta after a big new meal. I think that's a great house. <laughs> I think they ought to make out a law in America. Man. And you get full of nachos and tacos and tortillas, you know, and, and, and that stuff. And... And, and some of that good uh, rice they make up, Mexican rice, and all the uh, nachos and tortillas and that stuff. The only thing you do after that is just find a mimosa tree someplace by a stream and just lie down there and just let the world go to hell, man. <laughs> What I'm saying is they have their own way of saying things. And uh, that, so when we talk about translation, we're getting ready to talk about them now. 
The question is, uh, why are you saying the King James is the, th is the thing and superior to the others? All right, now let me say first before getting into the technical part of it, it is now uh, three minutes to 11 by that clock, and I got one minute past 11. How many of you have 11 o'clock? Let me see your hands. 11 o'clock, there's one there. Anybody else got 11? How many got something till 11? Can I see your hand? There's a bunch of them there. How many got something after 11? Let me see your hands. Oh, I'm the only one ahead of the crew here. I got something two minutes after. Which one's right? I mean, is the Spanish translation, the English translation, the French, or Tyndale, or Geneva, or the King James? Well, they're all good, I mean, you know. I mean, uh, what's accurate time? I know what accurate time is. And if I'm going to check stuff at the right time, I know right where to go, and I go to one place. And it wouldn't be Africa, and it wouldn't be Asia, and it wouldn't be Europe, it wouldn't be the United States. If I want to find where this church is located on a map, I'd know where to go, and I'd go to one place. And nothing else would be relative. The way to locate Mount Airy and White Plains, if you want to accurately locate it, is from one place. And it's not in Europe, it's not Asia, not Africa, not the United States. What's the temperature in this room? If I wanted to find out, I know what absolute temperature is. I know right where to go to get it. I go to the same place for location and for temperature that I go for time and for a Bible. I'd go to England. Amen. Greenwich. I don't care if you're flying a rocket or sailing you a, sailing you a cruiser or a destroyer at sea or you're traveling a X-15, if you know where you are, you check longitude and latitude. Yes, sir. And all longitude and latitude are set by the equator in Greenwich, England. And if you've got the right time, your time matches the clock at the observatory in Greenwich, England. And if you're a second off, you're wrong. That's right. English time. You don't get the stuff about race and stuff. I don't care especially for the English. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I, I don't like limes too well. It's too dry for me. Those are dry, you know, fish and chips. And I say, old oh boy, I don't want stuff. You know. I don't know why they call it the English Channel. It goes by France. <laughs> See how people are? I mean, God picked absolute time, English, absolute location. The British thermal unit is the temperature in this building. British thermal unit. Why you take a England today is a is a fifth rate world power. It ain't nothing. Japan, Germany, and America, and Australia ahead of ahead of ahead of England. Yeah. You know what they did? They gave up their book. They got rid of the Greek receptus. They got the King James Olive and Tyndall and Geneva and Coverdale and Matthews and replaced it with Nestle, the Greek text from Germany. And that was the end of England. That's about 1904. The English Foreign Missionary Society dumped the right text and picked up the wrong text. God wiped them out. But God has absolute time, English. God has absolute heat, cold English. God has absolute location, English. I had a Cuban up for me up one time. He left upset with me. Well, you love the King James Bible and other words down here in Cuba. We're just as important as you people are. You, you, you white folks think you're supreme and other stuff, 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 stuff. stuff. And I wasn't feeling very good that day, kind of mean that day for something. And I said, buddy, I said, if it wasn't for England, we wouldn't know where you were. <laughs> and he didn't get that right away, see. But Cuba on a map is longitude and latitude. And he's from England. Now, the Bible says where the word of the king is, there's power. So I've got a Bible here called the King James Bible. You know, well, King James is a homosexual, and yeah, you have blah, 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 blah. Uh, listen, God waited over the king of the English throne with a Jewish name before he put this book out. Because this ain't no English book, it's a Jewish book. Amen. So the first man with a Jewish name on the throne is James. That's your word for Jacob, didn't you know that? Amen. That's Jacobu. <coughs> Jacob. He couldn't put out a book like this under Henry and Richard and George. He waits to get a king with a Jewish name. You say, why are the oracles are given to Israel? The most high and mighty Prince James, by the grace of God. 
I'll show you something. <laughs> just, uh, just hit me just then. Is that number? They have a little book of numerology, and none of them ever got it right yet. But you go through your Bible, and you'll find the gestation period for a woman having a baby is nine months. That's fruit. You'll find in uh, Galatians, there are nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. That's fruitfulness. Abraham is 99 when he gets fruit but out of a dead body, and his wife is 90. See that thing? That word nine is talking about bearing fruit. Every time you find that thing, that's nine. The most fruitful Christian to ever lived was saved in Acts chapter 9. That's the Apostle Paul. Amen. That ten is Gentile. That nine is fruit-bearing. That's what that thing is. Can't beat that thing with a stick. You ever read uh, Genesis chapter 9, where Shem, Ham, and Japheth come from, and the prophecies are given on them? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's what that thing is. All right, now, look at this. Here's, here's Adolf Hitler in the Nazi party in Austria, Osterreich, the little thing you see me wear up here sometimes is an Austrian button. I'm south, I'm south Germany, Austria. An Austrian is not a real German, they say he's a German in three-quarter time. <laughs> in Germany they say if you're from north Germany, you say the situation is serious but not hopeless. In South Germany, you say the situation is hopeless but not serious. <laughs> That's the difference between them. Hitler couldn't have been a dictator if he'd stayed in Austria. The people wouldn't have taken him seriously. But the Germans, the Prussians, would have taken him seriously. That's where he made a living. He wasn't a German, he was Austrian. Guess you knew that, didn't you? Sure, man. Bonau, on the inner river. I've been right by his birthplace. Now he's at nine. That thing is something. Here is the number of Adolf Hitler's ID card in the Austrian Nazi Party in 1930. 555. Five, five. I got a photograph of it. Now you folks know the Bible. Don't you know what's coming? You know what the next one will be? After the devil's through in this earth, who comes back? Eight is something new. You circumcise the baby in the eighth day. Sure you know it's something new. Sunday's the first day of the week. You had seven days right before, didn't you? Then Jews count to seven. One, three, four, five, six, seven. What's the next one? Eight is the new week. Eight something new every time. Millennial reign. But what's back here? It's bound up. God got it. It's set mathematically. It's the computer job. Now there's a Roman Catholic Gentile who's anti-Semitic, and right before him, a little bit back, is Napoleon, and he's a Roman Catholic Gentile. And he's anti-Semitic. And right before him is a world, con these are world conquerors. Charlemagne. He's a Roman Catholic. Anti-Semitic. Who's before him? Well, before I step back here further, you're going to get Constantine the Great. He's a Roman. And he's anti-Semitic. And before him, you get Caesar. And he's Roman. And he's anti-Semitic. So this bird here is going to be a Roman Catholic anti-Semitic killer. What are you going to be? But well, looky here. What am that? <laughs> the millennium's there. And Christ is there. But there's a new heavens and new earth after the millennium. New heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem. Eight's new. <coughs> Now what happens after that in eternity? Got to be, well, if you want to see some fruitful, look at this. In eternity. Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. Heaven and earth shall pass away in the millennium. But my word 
shall not pass away. One, six, one, one. Add it. Now through, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But don't stop there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine, nine, nine. Amen. Now let's explain it. <laughs> well, well, all you can say is coincidence, right? Boy, that is some coinky dicky, I'll tell you. All right, Psalm 12. Psalm 12, verse 6. The word of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth down here. That's the word of God going through a purification down here. <coughs> Purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. What? The words. Not the preserved word of God. The preserved words of God. Thou shalt keep them. You can't find this in the new Bible. Took the thing out. Anybody got a new translation here? Want to buy any chance? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a very slim chance. <laughs> I'll do that in my classes sometime down there. Anybody got man nothing there? You can't get nothing in there. I've got I've got uh, I've got twenty nine tran different translations in my library. Use all of them. Don't believe any of them. <laughs> all right, verse seven. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them, now look out, from this generation forever. What is the antecedent of this generation? It isn't there. What generation? There's no generation given. It says, The words are pure words, silver tried, thou shalt keep them from this generation forever. What generation? David's generation forever? Well, the Bible wasn't even finished when he said that. This genera what is the generation where they're kept forever? That's the question. Well, whatever it is, look at verse 6. It had to be purified seven times before it could be kept. Oh, I come Revelation. Let's see who kept it. Up to where you're sitting. Uh, Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse, uh, oh, verse 7. Now, this is up in the church age where you're at. And this, you're beyond this church. You're in Laodicea. You're down in verse 14. But before your age started, look at this. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things say he that is holy, he that is true, so forth and so on. Verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door no man can shut. Thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and not denied my name. There's the singular, the whole body of it, like the word of God. But small w, written word. Now look at here. That's the only one of the seven churches that kept his word. And that's the one right before you showed up. Now, what you have there in, in the book of Revelation, I'm, I'm sure your pastor has taught you these things. Any Bible-believing church there is is going to teach you these things. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven church periods there. And if you've been taught right, you've been taught this first church of Ephesus, the beginning of the church age, around the time of the apostles, and that last church age over there, Laodicea, which is the lukewarm church that God said he spew out of his mouth. That's the church that God said, uh, you say you're rich and you're poor, and you know not you're poor, wretched, miserable, naked, and blind. That's the one you're in. Amen. You're in the one who said, you're not cold, you're not hot, so I'm going to spit you out. Amen. Now that thing in church history goes like this. And then right there, Philadelphia, that thing goes like this. That's the Reformation. That's Martin Luther, that's John Knox, that's Whitfield. And after that, Jonathan Edwards, Billy Sunday, General William Booth, Moody, uh, Torrey, Finney, that's, that's your Reformation. And up go like that, and boy, you get to 1900, and then whoops, 
Off she goes just like that. And I saw your Bible version there in 1901. Corrupt translation. English got rid of their right text in 1904. And from that then there come right now 214 corruptions of the King James Bible in English. 214 of them. That's Laodicea. It's where you are. But that church kept his word. That's the Philadelphia church period. And that thing will run about 1500 to 1900. And that's the one that kept his word. That's when your King James was translated. All right, now seven times. Your Old Testament is written in uh, Hebrew. But that's not the only language in your Old Testament. Some of the past in the Old Testament are written in Syriac. As a matter of fact, Daniel 2 to Daniel 7 is not in Hebrew. It's in Syriac. And the Syriac is a Hebrew, uh, a Hebrew uh, not a dialogue, a dialect. I uh, showed a meme. Uh, I'm going to write, uh, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar Jonah. All right, there's Bar. That's a B, the base. That's a, a race. That's an R. That's actually the thing that says, uh, the Hebrews write backwards. They write right to left. Now, if you translated that thing, you'd come left to right. You'd say this, the name of that thing is, that's, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. And that's all you've got there. Those are two radicals. That's the base and that's the race. Now, the Masora put in what they call Masoretic Vowel Points. And Masoretic Vowel Points are little, little things stuck under these letters. Uh, this is Segol. They call that one there. One is called Herek. One is called Kamish. Kamish Hatuf. And those little marks they put under those consonants to get a vowel. See, there's no vowel in there. You can't say that. You can't say burr without saying a vowel. If you say burr, you know what you do? You put an E in there or a U in there. Did you ever get a burr in your foot? <laughs> See, when you, when you say burr, you said more than just B-R. You said B-something R. And those are little, those are called vowel points. And this one here, you get this one here on assignment bar Jonah, you get that, and that gets commish under here, and that's the equivalent of putting an A in there. Simon bar Jonah. What do you mean? What does that mean? Simon son. Son of Jonah. That's a son. All right, now back in the Old Testament, that thing isn't bar in Hebrew, that thing is ben. Looks like that. That's a B, that's an N. B, N. If you take that B and that N and put that under it, so go, you've got Ben, Benjamin, son of my right hand. His mother called him son of my sorrow. His daddy called him son of my right hand. Son, that son and that son. But they're, they're Hebrew letters, but they're not, that ain't the Hebrew language. That's Aramaic. Christ on the cross. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. That's Syriac. Talitha Kumi. I say in thee, David arise. Uh, Damsel arise. That's Syriac. In the prayer words, you use the same letters, but it's not the same language. Now, I know, now that's heavy. See, it's just what a heavy question the gentleman asked. <laughs> but you've got to get this to understand this seven thing. Now, What's that word there? Well, some of you got two out of it. You can get more than that. What's that one there? What's this one here? What's this one here? Watch the same word. But see, it's a different language. But it has the same letters. Here's a good one. One. Look at that. Look at that thing. That's the same thing. You. That's 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 John. Uh, I'll have to get. Uh, I'll get a Greek New Testament to get the spelling of that. One is. That's John. Those are all John. But uh, I guess uh, in French, something like this, Jean, 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 somewhere or other, I don't know the French do well. <laughs> now, those are the same words, but they're not the same language. 
All right, now that Hebrew letters, but it's a different language. All right, New Testament, Greek. All right, as soon as that is complete, that's your complete Old and New Testament. It goes into translations. The first and oldest translation is a Syriac translation. Translating Hebrew, Syriac, and Greek into Syriac. That's done about 120 A.D. That's done about 30 years after the completion of the New Testament by John the Baptist. Do you know why it's there? Turn to Acts chapter, Acts chapter 11. I'll show you why it's there. The oldest translation of the Bible is not in Greek. Now, the original manuscript may be in Greek, but the first translation is Syriac. Now, look at Acts eleven twenty six. See, the, the, they won't teach you the truth. They will not teach you the truth. <coughs> Acts eleven twenty six. Look at the end of the verse. The disciples were first called Christians where? In Antioch. It's in Syria. Antioch of Syria. Your roots aren't in Jerusalem. You're not Jews. You're Gentiles. That's a Gentile church in Antioch. That ain't even in Palestine. That thing is north of Lebanon. It's north of Tyrone's Island. That's in Syria. That's where we came from. Christians. Antioch of Syria. So our first Bible is in that language. Now through the chat, turn to Acts 13. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a seminary education. Never mind what they teach at Crown College and Regent College and Bob Jones and Tennessee Temple and Moody and Fuller and Stetson and Howard and Judson. Just so much crap down the sewer, brother. <laughs> just forget it. If I had this room full of people from Oxford and Cambridge and Princeton and Heidelberg and Edinburgh and Berkeley and the University of California, University of Chicago, I'd put them asleep or I'd spit at them one time and drown the whole bunch. I could have that bunch in a raging fury in less than ten minutes. <laughs> and then yawn. That's the way to handle people. I, I'll get back to them in a minute. But, uh, do you remember when the Americans beat the Russians in hockey? That was the stupidest thing you ever saw in your life. When they got through that, the Americans just went crazy. They just went crazy. That ain't the way to win a thing like that. When you put on that big a show, stupid, you know what you show your enemy? You show him that you were scared to death and he almost whipped you. Yep. That ain't the way to do it. The way to do it is go. <sighs> <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Amen. One of the greatest lessons I ever learned, uh, I learned in Kentucky. And I was driving on a big bunch of cars. You know what happens when a woman gets behind a truck? You're dead meat, you know. I mean, when a woman gets behind a truck, you ain't going to pass the next six hills. <laughs> And, and I was, Kentucky like this. Kentucky's a roller coaster. The whole cut and picking thing. And I'm, here's a big old trailer up there, tra trailer going across, and a woman right behind him. And then another car behind her, and then me. And I'm in a hurry. <laughs> and that woman isn't going to pass, and the guy behind her is afraid because he got to pass her and the trailer. And I'm back in the back end. And a couple times I poke around there, and Kentucky just like this. So at least three times that woman could have made it. Now, I couldn't have made it. The guy hitting me couldn't, but she could have. And she had a brand new car. All these cars driving how fast they go. They know you do good no fast. You can't use anything. you get arrested if you use that speed. And these fast drivers, they can't do nothing when they get out there. They can't, and they don't know how to handle a car. And this woman, she's, you know, she's just staying right there, and he's staying right there, and I, I said, I'm all trying to waste that, so the next time I see a thing like that, I'm moving. And I saw a chance. <laughs> and I pull out of there about 60 and hit about 70 to clear those three cars, and I got just even with that truck, and here comes one right over the hill at me. And I used to play chicken when I was a boy in those cars, teenage, you know, cops and, cops and teenagers. <laughs> And we go out there on the highway, and we put the left wheel in that car on the center line, and then we come at each other. And the first guy to take his wheel off the line was chicken, you know. It's a nice, sweet game. <laughs> and I, I was a hippie before you know what a hippie was, man. I'm talking about 1939. And I, we go that up 60 miles an hour. And back in those days, 60 was, that was the top. You going like 60. It's good enough to get you killed. You don't have to go 70. <laughs> um, if, if you're at 60 and you hit a car at 50, you know what that's the equivalent of? That's the equivalent of pushing your car off a 10-story building and hitting the cement. 
no safety belt, safety belt. And many a time I've gone by there and just, you know, at the last second, and, and those running boards, you don't have running boards in your cars anymore, but I had running boards. And those things go, whee! Oh, now we get back, you turn out, I did not, you did too. I saw you, I'll be back, and we get back. <laughs> stupid, man, just stupid, just dumb, just plain dumb. But anyway, I call around behind this truck, and here comes this bold man like this, and I gunned it, and then just the last minute, and I cleared him, I think almost three inches. And, and, and as he went by, I got this peripheral vision, you see. I've been used to, you know, looking for the insignia on a smoky when he went by at night. And you get after a while, well, you can, you know, see both ways at the same time. And I go by looking at him, I figure he's going to be cussing, you know, or shaking his fist or white in the face or half scared. And as that guy went by me, I looked out there and he went. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I think that was 40 years ago or something like that. Now I've used that over and over again in street preaching. You got there and some guy gives you the finger, you know, or gives you that kind of stuff. And I go, hey. <laughs> I mean, the boys shake their day up, man. They're real, real bad. I've had him go on by and open the door just screaming, you know. <laughs> some guy, some college kid, you know. Hey, blankety, blank, 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 going by, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Here's five. Now, what, what's the next translation? The next translation will be called the Old Latin. And the Old Latin is before Jerome. It's about 180. And the old year King James Bible has some of those readings in it, and those are the ones they throw out. And those are old Latin manuscripts before Jerome. They're earlier than Jerome. Jerome's not to around 500 in there. Those are written back uh, before Vaticanus and Sinaiticus written. Good places are Acts chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, the first part of Acts, uh, John chapter 8, and a bunch of others. All right, the old Latin. Then after that, you have the Reformation. And the Reformation is Martin Luther. And then you have the English uh, Reformation with the Bible, and out comes the 1611. Purified in the furnace of earth. Seven times. Thou preserve them from this generation. Forever. That one goes to the moon. Now about the English translation, you asked about Tyndale. Now, they run like this, and I like I say, I don't know, I've got to get this in memory, and I've, I may make a mistake here in getting all these down, but there are seven of them. And they come in Tyndale and the Geneva. Now, both these are good Bibles. As a matter of fact, the King James Bible is mainly Tyndale. At the time, they said when they made the King James Bible, you should go by the Bishop's Bible. That was their instruction from King James. They didn't go by the Bishop's Bible. They went by Tyndale. He's the old boy that got uh, burned at the stake. And then you have uh, Coverdale. Then here. And you have Matthew's Bible. In here. And the Great Bible. In here. And this one here. It comes something like that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the purified English version. Which means that this is the last thing that God is going to say to any sinner on the face of this earth. I got it right in my hand. And there it is, right there. And you take any Bible in a foreign country that came from the right Greek text, and that's the right Greek text, right down through there, God could have given them in their language every word he wanted them to have. And I don't doubt in my mind he did. But the reason why I've got the advantage is English is the universal language. Whoever wrote this book knew what language would be best for the end time because the whole world, anybody, any country that chooses another language to learn chooses English. So if you've got this, what about the poor folks didn't have a King James Bible? They got a chance to get one now. <laughs> what about the poor folks that didn't have? What about the poor folks who couldn't read Hebrew? That's right. You talk about a dirty trick. Why did God put three quarters? Of the, look at here. 
You, you know how much of this Bible here is written in a language that makes up less than 1% of the language in this earth? That much of it. That much of your Bible is written in a language not 1% of the world ever spoke. Right. And you got a mean old God to do that. What about the poor folks that don't understand Hebrew? <laughs> Don't hear him say, what about these poor people who don't have an English Bible? Well, how about that, buddy? Right there. Do you know, do you know how many, I, I could, I'm, I'm just guessing. But do you know how many more people the King James Bible had led to Christ than the originals? Well, 20 times would be a conservative estimate. And if you want to get the greatest book that's ever been printed, we carry it at the Bible Baptist Bookstore. We carry German, Luther, and the King James in one edition. We've got one volume there where you've got Martin Luther's German on one side and the King James English on the other. And if you've got that, you've got the text responsible for over three quarters of the people that have been saved in this earth. Because before the King James came out, Martin Luther came out. And his Bible was translated into Slavic, the Saloa Bible, Russian, the Elizabethan Bible, Norway and Sweden and Danish, my Callus Bible, Italy, Diodati, French, Olivetan, Spain, Valera. Well, that King James Bible was all over the country before it was translated. All over the European languages. They got them from Martin Luther. If a man was a missionary in the foreign field before the King James came out, he got his text from Luther. Those Moravians, those Pietists, they're using Luther. If you got Luther's Bible and that English Bible, you got just about all the souls that have been saved in this earth, man. I mean, the new Bibles have to, you know, come from this one. The new Bibles always compare themselves with that one. <laughs> on, and on the mission field, the, the, the translations that are right come from that text. I don't know how many, I don't know how many. But boy, you take Judson and uh, uh, Goforth and Livingston and uh, Martin in Persia and Gilmore and... Mongolia and those fellows, they're all using that text. And the time the soul winning slacks off is when these new Bibles come in. That's when she slacks off. So